<laughs> hey everybody, my name is the Jackhammer 13, and this is Yu-Gi-Oh! The Duelist of the Roses. I've actually never watched the intro ever, to my knowledge. So that was pretty interesting. Um, I actually, I've tried to record this a few minutes back actually, and I did see it then. But I've never watched it on camera, and I've never really watched it in, entire, in its entirety, or even at all, until today. So, uh, we're going to jump into the new game so we don't have to uh, go through the cutscene over again, because that happens sometimes. Alright, pause. Okay, so here's the point in the video, and I need to tell you what's going on. I'm sure in a moment you're going to realize that, wait a minute, he just jump cut, and he normally doesn't do that. However, I've got a reason behind that. The next, I don't know, it was like maybe a minute and a half, I just droned on and on about stuff that I'm probably going to be going over in the update video that's going to be posted later on today. Anyway, so, I just wanted to cut that out because I figured it was uh, pretty useless stuff that I already was going to talk about. If at any point I have something like that, I more than likely will cut it out, but this is the only time I'm really going to let you guys know. And uh, if you see a jump cut or something like that, just assume it's something that I've already talked about or something that was completely random or doesn't really matter. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll get back to the video. The British Empire in the 1480s. The Wars of the Roses, a power struggle between the houses of Lancaster, the Red Rose, and York, the White Rose, to decide a royal successor, was nearing an end. With the Yorkists well in the lead, the reign of Richard III was but a step away. And in France, Yugi, or Henry Tudor, the last Lancastrian heir, was being forced to live a life of exile. The Lancastrian forces were rendered powerless by ancient cards of sorcery wielded by Sato and his seven followers who, known as the Rose Crusaders, served under the flag of Lord Crawford, a powerful Yorkist nobleman. Lacking a duelist to champion their cause, defeat was imminent for the Lancastrians. In England, dual card games were still at the fledgling stage. Thus, the Lancastrians had to look elsewhere for dual masters capable of facing the Rosencruz in battle. With this in mind, Margaret May Beaufort of Lancaster secretly requested a high druid to summon a duelist from another age. And that, my friends, is where we step in. Simon McMorrin. Oh! Summon from a mystic circle of red and white roses, the one capable of harnessing pure power. There was truth to the legend of the Rose Duelist. Lady Margaret, I, I did it. Now we have the means for defeating the evil forces of Rosencruz. Oh. My apologies. In my excitement, I'd forgotten I was in the presence of the Rose Duelist. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Simon McMullen, High Druid and Servant of Lancaster. May I be so bold as to ask the name of which the Rose Duelist would like to be known? Well, obviously there's only one way that you can uh, name a character, and that's after your YouTube name, right? <laughs> Wrong. Our name is going to be something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart, as it is my middle name, Talison. Yes, Talison is my middle name, and if you want a story on that, that is not how you spell that. Please, please, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, that's how you spell it. Okay. And if you want to know what Talison means before we continue on, excuse me, with uh, some of Morin's uh, amazing dialogue, Talison is Gaelic for Merlin, who was in the stories of uh, King Arthur. And the reason why my mom and dad chose that middle name for me is because, first off, they're a little high. And second off, um, they're both really into Gaelic mythology. Especially my father. He was reading a book on, uh, I guess, Old England uh, folk tales and stuff like that uh, before he died. And my mom loves Mists of Avalon. So it's obvious that you know there's something going on there that they really enjoy. And uh, Irish is the majority of my heritage, so it's another, you know, characteristic thing to me. And because I'm, my name is Michael Tallis and Goldsmith, you got Michael, a pretty average name. Goldsmith, which is 
pretty close to an average name, but still is pretty average in and of itself. And then you have Taliesin, which is very unheard of. Most people don't name their children Taliesin or have them to give them the middle name of Taliesin or something like that. So it shows that I, though being a normal person, have a bit of a, a centricity, if you, you know, really want to get down to it. Yeah, I sound like I'm speaking complete bullshit, and that's probably because I am. But, you know, tell me what your middle name is. Tell me what your full name is, honestly, in the comment section below. I want to know what you guys think, why your parents named you it. I want to hear all about your stories. We're in a storyline. I'm going to get back to that now. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, learn what McMoran has to say. So Simon McMoran says dot dot dot. Talison, Fine name indeed! Now, here's the situation. Yeah, I think his voice sort of changed to Macon. The year is 1485 and you are currently in Stonehenge near Salisbury, England. Which is pretty close to Salisbury, Maryland where I live. Um, uh, not really. Anyway, so near Salisbury, England. Um, the British Empire is in turmoil with the House of Lancaster's rightful claim to the line, being challenged by the Yorkist usurpers. I, I forgot what his voice sounded like, so I'm just making up as I go along at this point. The power struggle is referred to as the Wars of the Roses, a name based on the badges used by both sides. A red rose for the Lancastrians, and a wet rose for the Yorkists. Right now, our kingdom is threatened by the Yorkists and their wrongful claim to the throne. All because the Orcists enjoy the support of the Rose Crusaders and their sorceress White Rose cards. Using our Red Rose cards, we summon you, Taliesin, to this day and age. We hope that your dueling spirits will defeat the Rose Crusaders and lead us to victory. You will help us? Of course you will! Foolish of me to even doubt your loyalty's lie. The rumor has it that only the legendary Rose Duelist stands a chance against the power of the Rose Crusaders. We appreciate any help you can provide us against them. Oh, and before I forget, I should warn you that the rules to dueling differ from here than those from when your age. Here in England, dueling is governed by what we know as the perfect rule. In addition to several minor distinctions, there are two major differences. One is the existence of movement or positioning. The other is the decalator's concept. There are two aspects of dueling that were lost in the process when the ancient support of duel monsters was adapted to card form. The perfect rule represents these lost rules that were miraculously revived here in England. Perhaps a practice duel will serve better than an explanation. Shall we? Play a practice duel. Don't play a practice duel. We're gonna play a practice duel because uh, though I played the game, uh, I'm sure you guys want to see this practice duel and how it goes. Just so you know, it gets kind of boring from here on out, so uh, if you guys don't want to watch, I completely understand. Uh, it's pretty much just the tutorial, and it's easy stuff to know. Now, this probably, the first video is going to be one of the longest videos I'll have in the series. Um, for the fact that there's going to be a lot of stuff, honestly. So, let's start with the basics of dueling. Oh, uh, this tutorial, we need a different voice instead of his dumbass voice. <clears throat> Hopefully I don't have to speak with him again, because I probably won't remember what his voice sounded like. And I still don't remember it the most part. Alright, so. Tutorial. Let's start with the basics of dueling. First, let me show you how to summon a monster. To bring a monster into play, you must summon it from your hand to the field. Now let's draw a card from your deck. Alright, Dark Magician's turn. Tutorial. Currently, the card you're indicating in your deck leader, the Dark Magician. Let's order your deck leader to operate your hand. You can do this by selecting your deck leader and pressing the square button. See the blue square? That is the area where you can place your summon monster. Let's place the monster in a position directly in front of your card leader. Line up the cursor by pressing the up directional button and press the X button. This is your current hand. Apparently, there's only one monster in your hand that can be summoned to the field. This is because summoning a monster requires a certain amount of power. If something has four or more stars, you normally have to, uh, let's say, combine? I don't know what it's called. But anyway, fuck it. So, the spot currently indicated is where, you cur is where your currently available summoning power is displayed. So you can summon up to four stars, apparently. 
Anything more than four stars, you cannot summon at the moment, obviously. At the start of a duel, you have four summoning power points. This amount will increase by three every turn, and you can accumulate up to a maximum of 12 points. Oh, okay, so this works differently. Apparently, you don't need to... And I guess it's because it's the older game. But apparently, you don't need to uh, use multiple cards to summon a big card. So, like, I wouldn't have to combine two in order to bring one out. Unless, of course, the card itself is a special summon card, in which it needs that. I don't know. I'm not very big on uh, playing the Yu-Gi-Oh game. Uh, I haven't played this in a while. I enjoyed it. I'm not saying I didn't. I'm just saying I haven't played it in a while, so I don't remember. Anyway, back to the tutorial. When a monster is placed in the field, summoning power points equal to the monster's level are expended. Your current summoning power total points? Four. Or totals four, rather. Alright. Hence, the only monster card you can summon to the field is a level four monster, the Celtic Guardian. The card summons... Sorry. The dark cards are the monsters that you are unable to summon this turn. So, let's summon this Celtic Guardian. First, move the cursor over the Celtic Guardian card. <laughs> what an idiot, went past it. Press the X button. At this point, if you wish to content if you wish to cancel your selection, press the circle button. To enter your selection, press the X button once again. And it's been played face down. I draw one card. I now place one card face down in defense position. You've now summoned the Celtic Guardian and the card is ready for battles. Now, let's attack your opponent with the Celtic Guardian. To control a monster on the field, you must first activate the card you wish to move. Alright, Blue Eyes White Dragon's turn. This Blue Eyes White Dragon is your opponent's leader. Let's try to attack the enemy leader. First, let's activate your monster by lining the cursor over the desired card and pressing the X button. See the yellow square? This indicates the place where your monster can be moved to this turn. Your opponent's card leader is directly ahead. Let's move straight into the space. To move your monster, you must select your destination with a cursor and press the X button. The Celtic Guardian advanced one space, completing its move for this turn. Monsters can only move once per turn. However, a dex leader summoning does not count as a move. Hence, the monsters can move immediately after being summoned to the field. Since there is nothing else left to do this turn, uh, let's end it. To end your turn, press the start button. And it is now the other guy's turn. From this point, it's your opponent's turn. Your opponent is summoning a monster and preparing to attack you. And now, we duel. Now it's your turn. There's an enemy monster heading your way. So, let's use the Celtic Guardian to eliminate the threat. To attack your opponent's monster, all you have to do is move your monster into the same space occupied by the enemy monster. A monster attacking another monster is referred to as a battle. The outcome of a battle is decided by the attack and defense factors of the respective monsters. Putting the outcome aside, let's attack. Remember how to move your monster? Of course I do. Boom. Let's do it up! <laughs> Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want to see the actual thing. The fuck? Fine then. Alright, so you've eliminated your opponent's monster and moved one space closer to your opponent's leader. However, your opponent is now aware of your monster's strength and will probably bring a more reliable and powerful monster into play to retaliate. Now let's take a look at the factors that govern the outcome of a battle. <sighs> okay, so here's how your attack played out. Your Celtic Guardian was in the attack position. Your monster automatically assumes the attack position whenever it is moved. The attack position indicates that your monster has either moved or attacked. The monster that doesn't a monster that doesn't move and holds this position is said to be in the defense position. Currently, your Celtic Guardian and the opposing baby dragon are both in the attack positions. The outcome of the battle is decided by comparing the strengths of each monster. In this case, both monsters are in the attack position, hence only the attack factors of both monsters are compared. Therefore, I had 14, he had 1200, and so I raped his motherfucking ass. Like that. And he loses 200 life points in the process. 
As a result, the baby dragon is eliminated and the attack difference is 200, blah blah blah. Now let's take a look at this, what would have been if it was an opposing monster that was stronger. So let's just say, I'm facing this fucker um, in front of me. I don't know what the hell his name is, but uh, when you attack this creature, uh, the Kimura dragon, who has a shit ton of power, not much more than me, to be honest, but anyway, so I die, I lose health points, and uh, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Uh, I think this was pretty stupid stuff. I thought I was actually going to be battling, but now they're doing everything, so whatever. So what if the attacks were equal? Let's say a winged dragon versus... Oh, uh, sorry. A winged dragon, guardian of the fortress number one, with an attack of 1400 is brought into the play. And he's against your Celtic guardian. What would happen then? Well, we'd attack, just like so. And it's funny because we have the same of everything. But we attack each other, and we're both dead. Both monsters are eliminated, and neither player suffers any damage to their LPs. Now let's take a look at defense position. Fuck. Alright, so here's what we're going to do. Because this is obvious and easy stuff. I'm not even going to fucking worry about it. I'm going to skip through it. Uh, this episode is now done. Um, but I'll probably continue uh, recording. So I don't have to uh, turn off the recording and turn it back on and all that. So uh, thank you very much for watching. If I rambled on a whole lot and didn't really entertain you very much, stay tuned for next episode, which is probably going to be a lot better. Until then, this is the Jackhammer13, signing out.